Okay, everybody. Whoops. <laughs> okay, so now I see you again. Hi, folks. Um, good night, Salma. Right? <laughs> I wonder what time is it? What time is it in India? It's 10 p.m. Oh, 10 p.m. So it's actually <laughs> still, okay, but you're still there. So uh, good early evening, people in Berlin. Good mid-morning, <laughs> everybody in, in Wyoming and the rest is spread. Uh, do we have Australia still on the line? I don't know. Anyway, so uh, let's get started. Um, this morning we talked a lot of uh, about the uh, almost philosophical issues, what is liberal and all the issues came up. Uh, I promise you this afternoon, and this is followed up by, by, uh, by the next panel that then Jean Garrison uh, is gonna chair. We're gonna talk about populism until you cannot, do you do not want to hear the word populism anymore, right? So we, this is this, this whole afternoon, evening, et cetera, <laughs> is devoted to what, uh, what actually is populism, is American populism exceptional, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, for this session now, um, we have one and a half hours. Uh, for this session, we got two, uh, three, uh, three memos. Uh, the first by Marcia Pali from NYU, uh, the second one uh, by Nicolas Michalski and Narinya Nunez uh, from uh, University of Wyoming, uh, and last not least, uh, a, a memo by Robert Benson uh, from uh, Scripps uh, in Berlin. And Mark uh, Aspenwall uh, is our discussant. I don't see Mark. Here, the, here is. Okay, I, I, I see you. I see you, Mark. So the question is again, Mark, how do you want to proceed? Will you discuss everything together or shall we go uh, memo by memo? It's really up to you. Um, I'd like to go uh, back to the original format and do memo by memo. These are fairly okay. different papers. Okay, memos, super. That's okay. Okay, yeah. so in other words, you have seven minutes now okay. uh, to discuss uh, uh, Marcia Pali. Okay, thanks very much, Thomas. Well, these are uh, three really interesting uh, uh, papers, uh, proto papers, memos, um, a series of excellent ideas. And I'm gonna start with Marsha's um, on, on contemporary populism and evangelicals. And um, I, I really like this a lot, Marsha, congratulations. And thank you for providing it for us. Marsha points out that contemporary populisms um, emerge from, from political and cultural roots and traditions. Uh, she also uh, points out that populism of, uh, in intends to solve certain kinds of uh, uh, economic and way of life problems or duress that populations feel and that they find themselves under. Uh, and she distinguishes <laughs> between left and right populism and um, although, although kind of brackets left populism, I think in this to focus more on right-wing populism, which is understandable given the, the US focus of this paper uh, and, the, and the current political leadership that we have. It's not, it's not although good. both are, are quite interesting and important. Right. Um, for for Marsha, the, the, the success of populisms depends upon their understandability. Uh, the understandability and the resonance of solutions that they propose to these way of life and these economic problems. And I mentioned that context is critical, uh, the cultural and historical media, basis and, and uh, traditions are important. In a conflict zone, Maybe if I could just um, get you to mute sort of cool kids, those who are, who are not muted Washington, or whoever's... I don't know, Okay, uh, somebody had a microphone on, but but we, I think we're fine. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, sorry, sorry, I was muted too. Um, right, so um, so the sense of duress uh, per permits to 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 propose solutions. Uh, 
a certain amount of repetition and invocation of authoritative practices and uh, rooted in these cultural traditions is what's important for, for this paper and for this um, approach. They, they differ depending upon ref, left or right. Uh, both portray a sense of, of a sense of who, who was us and, and who was them. Uh, Marsha goes on to address the US case, the sources of stress, uh, economic and demographic sources of stress uh, and um, what the historical, cultural and uh, uh, idea-based influences, ide ideational influences are from the evangelical religious perspective. The US is a liberal covenantal republic uh, from the perspective of Aristotelian republicanism, uh, Protestant political theory and individual protectionisms, protections. Uh, and there, among evangelicals, she points out a kind of clear wariness uh, of, of state overreach among evangelicals. Uh, so, that, so that evangelicals, one of their principal concerns based upon, of course, the, the history of fleeing tyrannical leaders and oppression, religious oppression in Europe uh, is to seek um, a kind of a kind of new um, a new compact in which uh, the state is very limited. Individual protections are uh, sacrosanct, and local communities ga uh, gather together to essentially solve solve their problems. Now, in right and right, this is especially the case for right right populism. Uh, this wariness of oppressive government. I wonder really if this is that much of a factor now. Uh, it may be in the historical imagination. Um, we see, of course, a lot of selectivity in, in terms of the kinds of state um, actions and, and state activism where, where the right, right populists are quite willing to see the security apparatus extended and funded and, and become quite strong. Uh, and um, we've seen uh, gun protections, protections by the government of, uh, of gun rights uh, and, uh, and an increase in the, in the budget deficit, which of course implies extremely activist government. Protectionisms, the security and the southern border, anti-immigrant actions, all suggest a quite active government, a quite active government that is supported by right populists. Uh, very strongly. Um, so for evangelicals, Marcia sees the role of government as, uh, as in a way more important than religious beliefs in Trump's support. And, and, um, and in fact, in fact uh, the, the wariness of the state is um, a, a critical issue in their, in their, in their approach. I, um, I'd like to see, I guess, in a couple of comments here that I'd make in the last couple of minutes, in a bit more attention to the kinds of mechanisms and connections that link scripture and culture that you mentioned at the top of page five and contemporary populism. There's a lot of, as you point out, apparent contradictions in uh, church and evangelical support for, for populism. Why are evangelicals still wary of the state and how is this manifested? What evidence is there uh, in your view to show this? Um, another comment that I would make is to try to draw out a bit more the religious and cultural tension between church and faith and the government. And why would Trump be a good representative why would Trump be a good representative of evangelicals? In fact, I think as you see, as you've, as you've pointed out in the paper that the immigration issue, in, in, in the immigration issue, churches were anti-Trump. They were, they were much more likely to be, um, to be um, let's, say, let's say, empathetic toward immigrants to a certain extent. Um, and that's the evangelicals have been uh, in more Let's say more more active in the in the economic area, rather than rather than in way of life. So maybe maybe a big clarification, and if you could tell us a little bit where you're going with the with the with the paper on these issues. 
Um, you also point out that there's a negative correlation to xenophobia among Mark, social Mark, your tendons. time is starting to be up. <laughs> okay, Thomas, I'm going to uh, draw this to a close here. I've got one more point, I think, to make. Um, why is there a negative correlation between church attendance and xenophobia among evangelicals? And why awareness of the state and how does that connect to Trump support? I'm not sure I've been totally clear on this, but uh, thank you very much, Marsha, for a really interesting paper. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you, Mark. So uh, we, we, we do exactly the same as we did in the, in the previous uh, uh, session. So uh, Marsha has a, has a very short time response now to, to, to deal with some of the issues uh, raised by Mark. Then we open it up and please use the chat function if you want to speak, put your question in and I try to note and then we'll go in the order um, in, in, in which people um, uh, uh, use, the, use the chat function. Do not use the hand raise function apparently it only works partially for some people. I don't know what's going on there. So, uh, Marsha, do you want to quickly respond? Yes. Um, first, um, thanks to Mark um, for this um, digest of a digest. Our memos are sort of digests of longer papers. This is a digest of a digest. Thank you. I also want to thank everyone involved in putting together the, the conference. I was um, twice a fellow at the Vico, so not far from the Freie Universität, and um, I teach one semester a year at the Humboldt. Um, Universität, um, and I miss Berlin very much. Um, plunging into Mark's um, questions, um, if first, uh, if, mm, drawing on some of the dis previous discussion, I, I heard Jan Werner Müller's um, name come up, and I'm glad that it did, in order to say that I don't fully climb on that bandwagon, uh, because I think we have to be wary of um, calling something democracy when we like it and populism when we don't. Um, a theory of populism has to include all its iterations on the left and on the right. And I didn't elaborate on um, populism on the left in the United States because I ran out of word limit um, for the memo. Um, uh, and, but of course, my litmus test for any theory of populism is whether it also would include the phenomena such as the Bernie Sanders campaign, Podemos, and so on. To Mark's um, question, um, I've, uh, for those of you who have the memo, um, the most important sentence, and this goes to your first question, Mark, is, um, is the sentence which explains that um, in dealing with economic and way of life duress, um, duress prompts for various psychological reasons of which there is a long section I couldn't include, um, us them binaries. And um, in the, the understanding of how us them binaries works is culturally contingent. In the United States, the standard them is federal government and um, new immigrants, African-Americans and other uh, related outsiders. And under duress, what happens, there's an A and a B of what happens, and this is in the memo, if you can find it, um, that um, the um, first response, a resisting federal government, which is to constrain um, what we call small government in his small governmentism here, to restrain um, federal government, deregulation, tax cuts, and limiting of government programs, except in order to accomplish B, which is um, constraining other outsiders, such as new immigrants, African Americans, and other minorities. So the question mark you asked about the border wall and um, other, the Muslim ban, and the bringing of federal troops into Portland, Oregon, and so on, are a classic example of um, a right-wing populist program in the United States calling for small governmentism, a resistance to big government, except to accomplish the constraining of uh, the other them, which is minorities in new immigrants. So um, that um, A and B section is um, very clearly illustrated by the current 
Trump um, a set of proposals of solutions to solve current problems. Then you asked a series of very interesting questions about evangelicals. Um, and the um, best research, um, well, I'll back up and just say one sentence. I've been doing field research and other research on evangelicals uh, for, a, for more than 10 years, 13, 15 years, um, all over the country. Um, the best research on their response to the 2016 um, election was that their number one priority was not religious positions associated with evangelicals, such as opposition to abortion, gay marriage, and so on, but that their number one reason for voting had to do with what policy would better the economy. In fact, the economy was many, many times more important than LGBT rights or opposition to abortion. And because of historical and theological resistance to state and state churches, um, evangelicals tend to the belief that the best way to improve the economy is to get government out of it. And that that was the primary reason for the Trump vote. Okay along with, in a more minor position, other things like gay marriage and so on. If you'd like me to stop here, I can. I was just trying let's, to address some of Mark's questions. You have, you have a chance at the very end to speak again, but I would really like to, um, to, to uh, bring in uh, our participants and have them ask the question. The first one um, is Celia, Celia Toro in Mexico City. Celia? Thank you, Thomas. Marcia, I enjoy your paper very much because it, it, it tells me many things about my concerns regarding changes in US migration policy over the last 20 years, perhaps. Uh, and I was wondering if you could tell me a bit more about uh, this American uh, evangelicals belief uh, regarding national security and migration and immigration. What do you mean? Um, so the, also that dovetails with one of Mark. Uh, no, no. Let's collect, ah. and, and 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 then in the end, you I give you five minutes in the end to deal with any questions that come. Okay, I think yes. it's easier because then we can no uh, have people in. No sorry, problem. sorry, Marsha. Okay, no great. Um, <clears throat> I put myself on the list next, uh, and I, I wanted to comment on this really interesting finding on the voting behavior. Um, of evangelicals uh, voting according to, to their uh, economic and political beliefs rather than their cultural and religious beliefs. Now, uh, as, you, as you yourself show in the memo, um, that's not completely totally new because I mean that used to be the case with Reagan, with Bush, uh, etc. except that in those two cases there was no contradiction between voting for Reagan or Bush in terms of your cultural religious beliefs and your economic and political beliefs. But with Donald Trump, this re there's a real clear contradictions, right? Uh, in terms of his moral behavior, et cetera. So how do we explain, my question would be, how do you explain that for the evangelicals in this particular elections, the economic and political beliefs Trump, <laughs> Trump, their, their moral and, 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 and religious uh, beliefs. Okay, next one is Hans Jürgen. Hello, Marsha. Uh, I'm uh, concerned about the relationship between evangelicals and, uh, and populists. In which sense do you think that evangelicals are populists and uh, uh, are all evangelicals populists uh, only under certain conditions? And uh, so apparently not all populists are evangelicals that, is, <laughs> that, is, that we can take for granted. Uh, uh, so uh, if you clarify about that, in which sense would you think uh, uh, evangelicals, all of them or only some of them, fulfill the criteria uh, your criteria of what you define as populism. Okay, thank you. Next is Robert. 
Uh, thank you for the for the fascinating paper. I, I suppose it's it's not that different than what Thomas asked. I mean, what if 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 Trump was ambiguous on on the economy, not a classical conservative, then how does this kind of align with your results that evangelicals were voting on the basis of small government? Thank you. Uh, next is. Uh... <laughs> The woman sitting right next to me, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very briefly. Thanks a lot, Marsha, for this fantastic paper. I'm glad that we connected uh, last year. Um, and I hope we can continue our discussions in Berlin at some point. I have a question with regard to the role of the state. You know, in the liberal script and in the contestation of the liberal script, because if I understand your argument correctly, the evangelicals contest the liberal script not so much with regard to core principles such as diversity, you know, I mean, gender equality, LGBTQ plus rights, and that, but it's, it's mostly about the role of the state, right? And I think it makes a difference, or maybe not, but the question is how, 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 how central is the state for the liberal script? If you could test the role of the state as too big, right, is that then not simply an internal contestation, which pushes the liberal script to a more neoliberal variety, that it remains liberal, right? Or uh, is it an external contestation of the liberal script that uh, advocates an alternative that is fundamentally illiberal? And um, I, I, have, I just want to flag the issue because I think we also come back to this, uh, to this question about the role of the state in Benson's paper. So we might have, the opportunity to continue this discussion, but I think it's an important question, right? What the role of the state is in the liberal script. Um, um, and I leave it here. Okay, I have one further, but except that on my screen, I can't really see who it is from I, who is that? Anyway, can you distinguish between reasons for the demands of, for populism? I, I can't really see on my screen who this is, but just talk whoever it is. Uh, that was me, but I think Michelle had yeah. a question. Hello. Michelle's before on the chat. Oh, okay, yeah, he raised his hand, and of course I couldn't see that. So Michelle and then Laura. Laura, go ahead and then I go after you. And Jessica. Okay, uh, thanks Marsha. A long time that we saw each other. Good to see you again. Uh, uh, even in this format here. Um, I mean, I, I'm also struggling in my, in my work about this definition of populism and to which extent can we include leftist populists. And I, I just want to point out that I have increasingly the feeling that this sort of thin understanding of populism is something uh, that creates too many false positives. I mean, if it is really only that you are critical of a lead and you put a sort of a homogeneous understanding of the people against this elite, you create so many false positives, like in, in my understanding, like the Wir sind das Volk in Leipzig, like the socialist critical uh, of World War I and stuff like that. And therefore, in my understanding, I would say if we have a sort of an ideational understanding of populism, it includes something like a deep proceduralized anti-liberal notion of the general will. And in that sense, my feeling is at least that some of the leftist populists are different, are different in the sense that if you take, for example, Tsirpas increase, he was four or six years. Our next strategic plan. Okay, he was four or six years in power and he did not go after courts, he did not go after minority rights, he did not challenge pluralism, and he did not Victoria, challenge... Who are you the, mentioning? I, I, could, I couldn't hear, there was an alternate microphone on. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I was mentioning Tsirpas as a left populist who was in power. Greece. Greece. Okay, I can hear you now, thank you. Okay, next is uh, Laura. Yeah, so I, I guess the question goes a bit in the same direction. That is, um, can we distinguish here between the reasons that you might isolate for demands for populism on the one hand and when we get a supply from political leaders of populism? Because it seems to me these are two dimensions that have to be distinguished. And uh, when you talk about the reasons for the demands for populism, um, 
what kind of context do we need to give these? So the reasons that, that you call duress in the paper seem to be, you, you present them as though they're sort of objective reasons, but it seems that many of the grievances that are expressed in the evangelical community are, um, would be difficult to, um, to really support with objective evidence. So grievances of reduced rights, for example. So and many evangelical communities argue that Trump is their savior because they have marginal um, identities because Christian culture is under attack. But you know, in terms of an objective duress, there, there are no laws that, for example, have limited the rights of Christians to act as Christians in the United States, for example, right? So the question is what, is, what counts as a grievance and when is that grievance gonna be activated in the way that you talk about in the paper? Okay, uh, last not least, last question by Jessica. Jessica? Jessica, are you there? Okay, maybe not. So then I would invite Marsha to answer whatever questions you want to answer. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. So there's a lot. Um, how much time do I have, Thomas? Uh, three minutes left, but if you go one minute over, it's fine. Impossible, but I'll do my best. Okay, so one of the things we have to distinguish is between what I wrote about populism in the memo and elsewhere, and what I wrote about evangelicals. All evangelicals are not populists, or populists are not evangelicals, and um, so uh, we, we have to be very, very clear about that. The first question was highly interesting, um, came up a number of times about evangelicals and immigration and their differences with Trump. And this is, um, this is one area where, in fact, evangelicals um, did differ. E um, even Trump supporter evangelicals differed with Trump on his um, uh, anti-immigrant border wall, um, anti-refugee policy. Whereas populists, um, meaning most populists are not evangelicals, whereas populists were very supportive of Trump's immigration bans because of what I said earlier, because it keeps, it constrains them. Um, evangelicals ran into contradiction with scripture, love the stranger, welcome the stranger, help the needy, the stranger, even the enemy. And even, and this was one difference between evangelical, uh, evangelical since Trump. And when, after Trump was elected, and he started putting in some, many of these anti-immigrant provisions, um, uh, many evangelical churches um, protested, including the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest in the United States, one of the um, evangelical associations, and the National Association of Evangelicals. Um, second, even um, the uh, evangelical um, res um, resistance to large central government comes both from history from being the whipping boy, essentially, came from the, you know, the Hanhuta and the anti, um, An Anabaptists and so on, who were the whipping boys of the state churches of uh, Europe in the early modern era. And so uh, escaping the persecutions and discriminations of states and state churches is woven into the DNA of um, American evangelicals who are after, after all, the heirs of the European evangelicals who left to escape persecution by states and state churches. Um, resistance to the state is also woven into the theology with the emphasis on sola scriptura and the Priesterschaft um, aller Gläubigen, where every individual reads the Bible for her or himself and therefore must be protected from the constraints of state and state churches in their areas of belief. So there's a historical or theological reason for evangelical resistance to big, um, big government. In the election, again to repeat, preference for Trump was that their understanding of improving the economy, which is, was the number one factor, economic betterment, um, that Trump's small government positions vis-a-vis -vis the economy was the way to go. Um, now, 
So Trump continues to present his economic platform as small government. We're going to cut taxes. We're going to cut federal programs. We're going to put the money back in your pocket. We're going to deregulate um, business and deregulate environmental protections in order so that you, the little guy, the ostensible little guy, can more freely conduct your private business. And this is um, appealing not only to evangelicals for the reasons I've just um, expressed, but also to right-wing populists of all stripes in the United States. To the question, are evangelicals always populist? No, not at all. And I wrote a book, which is also in German, Die Neuen Evangelikalen, and in English, The New Evangelicals, um, looking at um, evangelicals whose activism, forget how they vote, whose activism looks like a list of the Green Party. It's Umweltschutz, it's environmental protection, it's helping the needy, the inner city kids. Um, it looks like a standard progressive program. So evangelicals are by no means always populist or even always what we would consider right wing in their activism, bracketing their voting. Um, in, just in terms of the criteria, remember I, um, in my paper, I was not beginning from your overarching framework of the liberal script. I was beginning, why is populism persuasive? This goes to the question, this very nice question. Thank you, the supply and demand for um, populism. Um, uh, and um, so at the beginning, the, f the five or so criteria that I lay out are to answer the questions, why is populism persuasive? Right. Not what do populist demagogues do, but why is the are the proposed solutions convincing and persuasive to large numbers of people and when? So duress is a big uptick and that can be economic or way of life duress. Um, to the question of objective duress, I think that's very um, that's not helpful in understanding how people see the world. If people think they're under duress, they're under duress and they're going to um, respond to the world as if they're under duress. And, um, and my, my purpose in my paper was to understand why people found or find populist program persuasive. And if it's answering duress that they feel in there and believe is occurring in their daily lives, then they are under duress and they are going to respond positively to populist solutions if it, they answer the duress that they feel. And that's how to understand um, from, try to understand. And um, this comes directly out of my many, many years of field work. If you, if you want to find out how people um, understand the world around them, you have to listen to how they see the world around them from their perspective, from their perch. I think I'm out of time. Yeah. Super. Thank you so much, Marsha. This is terrific. Um, so without further ado, we move on uh, to the next memo and it's Mark again. Right. Uh, thanks very much, Thomas. Uh, this is uh, a paper by uh, Nicolas and Narina and uh, called the examination of the persuasive effects of political rhetoric on interpersonal behavior. Um, this is uh, first really overtly empirical paper that we've had here. And I am going to summarize it uh, as best I can in the next uh, seven minutes or so. Um, it opens with a pretty horrifying anecdote of the actions of a disabled veteran on a, on a boy at some kind of a, a public event. Uh, this vet apparently influenced by the nationalistic rhetoric of President Trump. And so the question being in the paper, the empirical question being whether uh, being exposed to intense political rhetoric can directly influence actions toward members belonging to the target group of that rhetoric. In other words, people who are apparently misbehaving, as I understand it. Um, this was tested, this, this effect was tested on undergraduates at the University of Wyoming. I hope they're all okay, they are still, um, in, in the immigration area. 
uh, with three underlying uh, assumptions at the start. One is that the moral characteristics of fairness and care are liberal, while in-group loyalty is a conservative characteristic. Secondly, conservatives who believe in a dangerous world are more likely to, to, be, to have anti-immigrant perspectives and beliefs. And thirdly, the in-group loyalty is more anti-immigration. And, and the results partly supported these assumptions, but not entirely. And uh, here is where it gets pretty interesting. Um, how is this related to rhetoric? Well, the game is used. Um, I have a question, I'll, I guess I'll bring it up later. What, what the relationship of this study at Wyoming was to, I think what was called a main study a mechanic, using a mechanical Turk uh, survey. Um, a, the, a game was used called a dot game to look at the effects of rhetoric on allocating resources. What happens? Well, a dot game is a speed test. Uh, and it is, um, it, it, is, it, it is preceded by a video advertisement that was either pro or anti-immigrant. And this advertisement, of course, is designed to influence the outlook or behavior with these uh, moderating characteristics I mentioned before uh, being important potentially to, 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 to influence their final opinion about immigration. The moderating effects with these moral beliefs and a fear of a dangerous world. The results were that those who watched the anti-immigrant advertisement were more likely to give away bonus money than those who didn't. And this is the opposite of what was expected, but the effect was not significant. Some conservatives who watched pro-immigrant ads were actually then less likely to exhibit in-group behavior. Uh, as they point out in the paper there, the sample size is rather small, so it undermines and they're gonna need to, and they're planning to expand this study to, to, to a bigger population. Um, I guess my questions would be, and, I, and I, I, my comments would be, um, perhaps to get the bottom line conclusion headlined a little bit more, that the immigration message, as I understand it, might change some moral perspectives, but not necessarily behavior, seems to me the, the critical underlying uh, conclusion. Um, I also wonder what the difference is between the pilot study and the main study, something I mentioned earlier. Can you, could you elaborate on this? Who did the main study and uh, who did the dot game? The main study uh, is mentioned on page two. The trade-offs in moral foundations, I assume, are, are liberal care versus conservative in-group, um, conservative in-group um, um, moral attitudes and perspectives and foundations. Maybe I've got this slightly muddled up, but maybe if you could perhaps clarify that for us, that would be great. And I think that's it. Thomas, I'm going to hand this back over to you and to the, to the paper authors. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks again, uh, Mark. Um, Nicolas or Narina, do, do you have the immediate urge to respond? Yes, I can uh, respond to the comments. Uh, first off, thank you very much for your comments re regarding our paper. Um, first, I'll address your, your question um, with the pilot study and the main study. So initially, the reason for the pilot study was to essentially test assumptions of our main study. So essentially, we were um, looking to confirm or support the fact that liberals tend to have higher values of care and fairness, whereas conservatives tend to have higher values of in-group loyalty authority when it comes to um, moral foundations, as well as we were looking to test the assumptions that um, a more conservative political orientation as well as higher beliefs in a dangerous world would correlate with uh, more negative immigration views. And additionally, that trade-offs in moral foundations, such as prioritizing in-group loyalty over care and fairness would lead to these more negative immigration views. So that's that was essentially testing assumptions going into our um, 
our main study, which was actually the focus of looking at the effects of the rhetoric on behaviors. Um, so the reasoning for this and the reasoning of looking at morality as a factor is that in 2019, there was a paper published by Monroe and Plant um, looking that described more the trade-offs in moral foundations are, can be an explanatory variable of our prejudicial beliefs. So those who, their studies focus on LGBT individuals, they found that individuals who um, have higher levels of in-group loyalty or higher, in higher values of purity and lower levels of care and fairness are more likely to be, um, have anti-LGBT beliefs. So that is, um, we took that theory and we applied it to how an individual might respond to immigration rhetoric. So for that being um, individuals who have higher levels of in-group loyalty might then discount care and fairness when it comes to an interaction with an immigrant, someone from that outgroup, therefore leading to more negative behaviors toward that individual in turn of um, taking more money in the task. And just to, just to give a little bit of clarification when it comes to um, the main study and why we chose the dot game as a task, in designing um, this study, trying to find a task that actually measured direct behavior rather than someone's perceptions of what they would do in a situation was very hard to figure out what task we wanted them to do. Um, but we came across the dot game, which is a resource allocation task. And generally, when you look at this um, negative immigration rhetoric, it generally focuses on competition for resources, competition for jobs and things of that nature. Therefore, we felt like a resource task would be um, most beneficial in trying to get um, a desired behavior. So that's generally, um, to clarify that one up a little bit. Uh, Narina, you want to add something? I just want to add one thing that might be clear too. The dot, the dot game uh, is a game that you're playing with, with someone else uh, and you're led to believe that the someone else is either uh, an immigrant or not an immigrant. And so the allocation then we were thinking would differ depending on whether you thought you were uh, playing with an in-group member or out-group member. But surprisingly, actually, if you got the anti-immigration video before the game, you actually were, uh, overall, they gave a little bit more money to the immigrants. So it was sort of a boomerang rather than a straightforward effect. Okay, uh, floor is open. Whoever wants to raise a question. Looking at the chat. At the moment, anybody can intervene if you want, just turn your mic on. Okay, let me, let me ask a question then. Um, I'm a bit, I'm a bit worried about the whole uh, causal, uh, causal mechanism between the dot cam on, uh, as, as, as sort of the, the, the behavior the component and then uh, the, the political rhetoric. Um, and I mean, in the, in the paper, you do, uh, um, you do emphasize that you also tested for what the priors uh, of these people were, you know, so, but nevertheless, I'm a, a bit wondering if a little, if, if, why you would expect that a stimulus, even if it is very strong, uh, would translate immediately into some behavioral outcome. You know, I'm thinking, I mean, I would, for example, uh, what if you would repeat this? Yeah. Um, so, so I'm, I'm a bit worried about uh, to make too much of the non-finding. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you translate that into, into the beginning of your story, uh, the, 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 the thing is not really, I mean, this, this guy who claimed uh, that he just <laughs> took the president's orders by, by beating up that boy, I mean, he was exposed 
to that rhetoric time and again and again and again and and again you know so to put that into your experiment with one stimulus um i guess that's my question yeah um yeah so initially the reasoning for um using just a single stimulus um was taking the situational morality approach um looking at you know previous psychological studies that show certain situations with individuals in um higher authoritative positions can momentarily um lead someone to to, to act based off of essentially what they're told to do so so we kind of took that approach of situationally if someone um, sees this ad from President Trump talking about, you know, how immigrants are dangerous and how immigrants are coming to take what you have, in, in that situation, if you're dealing with an immigrant or what, who you believe is an immigrant, will you, will you momentarily act in that situation? However, like you said, um, this is something we considered um, in writing up the paper in full that, you know, you might not see this effect after just one exposure. Um, generally, if, if you're exposed to rhetoric like this once, you're exposed to rhetoric like this many times, whether it be television, um, through regular interactions, online, whatever it is. So um, I think going forward, looking to um, find a way to do this with repeated exposure without um, tipping off to participants exactly what we're getting at, because that was, that was kind of the dance that we had to play with running this study is, you know, how to do this without them without participants realizing what we're trying to do. And Thomas, you, you got exactly right. That's the, the crux of this. But because a lot of people have claimed that rhetoric affects behavior, we were trying to see if we could at least in this small little way show a shift in people's behavior because of the rhetoric. Um, obviously, in real life, people expose themselves to similar rhetoric over and over and over again by the media that they choose. And that's probably what we see this very huge behavior of hurting a child um, after repeated exposure. This is one piece, it's the first step. Super, uh, thank you so much. Robert has a question and Tully. Okay, wow, finally we've got some people. Robert? Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Good, thank you. Uh, thank you for the paper. I just, he hearing, hearing you talk, uh, Thomas, and, and, and then the response, I'm reminded of the, the Southern Poverty Law Center um, has, been, has been kind of having a running list or keeping tabs on, on hate crimes in the US, right, since the, since the election of, of, of Donald Trump. And it, 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 seems, it seems to me that at least the anecdotal evidence is quite clear right, that, that having somebody in a position of relative authority and prestige, the president, that there is then this kind of trickle down effect. And the, the SPLC has done this, but also the ACLU has done this, various other kind of hate monitoring organizations have done this. I, it, it, to what extent does this kind of doing a, a scientific experiment, if you will, I mean, then how do you, and then how do you add to this, or kind of engage with this more macro evidence that we have? Next one is Tali. Uh, thank you. This question is uh, prompted by um, Professor Nunez's response. Um, you know, you mentioned that, like, it, you know, in real life, I mean, especially in hypermediated societies like ours, where people cultivate an environment of semantic stimuli, a kind of cocoon of political messaging uh, for their for their awareness to be housed in every day, um, and where this is takes the, where this is the, this the this um, capacity to kind of cultivate your own um, media, um, your own kind of self-administered uh, um, uh, political stimulation machine is 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 itself you know um, wired up through market transactions. There is a demand for this rhetoric. The demand is satisfied. And the rhetoric has the consequences that it has, whatever those happen to be. Um, where, where is there space here to insert responsibility? 
you know, I mean, if people want to be, people want to have access to that kind of stimulation and there's a, a market mechanism there in place. I mean, I, I you know, I'm not, I don't think that that arrangement is all things considered justified or good. But if you, you know, in your response, you said, you know, that, that this people choose to surround us. I mean, where do we pit, do we pit, you know, do we associate responsibility with the providers or with the demanders or both or where? I don't know. Next one is Gabriele. Hi, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, very interesting paper um, and project. Uh, I was wondering, so if I understood correctly, the allocation in the allocation decision, participants could decide to allocate money to either themselves or the other one. So I was wondering if you're planning to maybe expand it, would it be useful to have a situation in which participants can allocate money to themselves uh, someone else who is an immigrant and someone else who is an in-group member, because in that way you may get that solidarity towards other in-group members rather than just the selfish behavior toward oneself as compared to altruism. All right. Um, I see no more questions, so uh, you got the final comments, uh, Narina and Nicolas. Nick, can I start with this one? Yeah, because I, I think, Gabriella, that, that is amazing. That's a great idea. Um, because we are pitting our, our own self-interest against uh, an immigrant. It would have been a very interesting thing to allocate between two, uh, one in-group member and one out-group member. And I think that's an excellent idea. And I would love to try this at some point. Uh, we really want to be able to try to start to piece apart how rhetoric can affect your own behavior and going to the responsibility issue. And I think Nick will probably talk about this as well. You know, the theorists that study morality and moral foundations, they suggest that sometimes we, we do think we're being moral, but we're picking one specific part of our morality. So uh, purity might be the most important uh, moral foundation. And that's why we choose to hurt someone else because they're impure. Uh, whereas someone else might have careness or fairness, sorry, as their moral foundation and decide to be fair to someone else. So that's maybe where the responsibility comes in. And I'll throw it to Nick. Yeah, I think Narina, Narina hit the nail right on the head with that. I mean, the way we, the way we look at morality and, and how we're studying it now is that um, it, it's no longer moral versus immoral. It's, it's individual morality where, where someone's someone's uh, moral foundations might not line up with another individual's. However, they both view themselves as moral people. Um, but going, going back to that first question of, you know, how does doing an empirical um, study kind of add to what we're seeing in a, in a, um, in a larger sense? And, and my response to that would be a lot of what we have is um, correlational evidence. Um, in 2019, from the Pew Research Center, they ran a they ran a survey of I believe somewhere around 10,000 individuals. Um, but people saying that the tone of um, political debate in the U.S. has become you know significantly more negative, significantly more fact based, and um, both Republicans and no, both conservatives and liberals have both said that um, heated and aggressive political rhetoric. Um, they believe that it makes violence towards the target of that rhetoric, uh, whether that be immigrants, LGBT individuals, whoever it is, it makes violence against them more likely. Um, so based off, you know, that research, as well as, you know, the incident that I mentioned in uh, Montana, as well as other things that have happened um, with the, also the shooting that took place in El Paso um, at the Walmart where the Shooter's Manifesto sort of mirrored rhetoric that um, the president was saying. We wanted to empirically um, look at a causal relationship. Like, can, can this rhetoric directly lead to behavior? Well, we see um, increases in hate crimes um, since you know, the rhetoric has been put out there. We can't directly say though that it's, it's a cause and effect sort of thing. And, um, an empirical study won't give us that cause and effect, um, but it will give us evidence to suggest that that might be what's driving the behavior. Super. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we're a little bit ahead of our time, which is good, so we can uh, 
do the last. Uh, no, Gabriel. Uh, so we can do the last uh, 35 minutes that we have. If people want to raise other uh, other issues related to the to the three papers again, but uh, again. Uh, Mark, we are working you very, very hard today. So you had to do three papers rather than just two. But uh, floor is yours again. Okay, I'll send you the bill, Thomas. That's a, that's yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, I'm going to go over to the final one here. Let's see. Get my notes up. Uh, and this is Robert's paper, an, uh, the another fascinating paper, a group of three. Uh, great memos here. And uh, Robert uh, links the, the work of, of, of Richard Hofstadter's uh, work of the 1960s on the paranoid style in the context of the Goldwater nomination to the current Republican Party under Trump and the Trump um, political style, I suppose, and, and, and campaign and government and so forth. Uh, the, uh, the Hofstadter paranoid style in the context of the Goldwater nomination was about conspiracy, about rumor, disinformation in, in US politics, fear mongering, and so forth. Uh, Robert's uh, central point here is that what's new in current politics is the adoption of this style by the entire Republican Party. Uh, he also makes it uh, makes the point that uh, Trump's appeal is wider than Goldwater's. We obviously know that because Goldwater failed miserably to to uh, to gain the White House in, uh, in 1964 despite his despite his overt appeal to the darker sides of our nature. Um, he, he, a part of this is that uh, in, uh, in contrast to economic policy, identity is less susceptible to compromise. It's a zero-sum game, as we've talked about several times already today. Um, I think I would, uh, I, I would say, um, I, I'm going to ask some questions here and, um, and make some comments. I mean, I suppose First of all, uh, my, my sense is that the current style of the Republican Party and of Trump might owe more to Richard Nixon than to, than to Barry Goldwater in the sense that uh, Nixon was, I mean, it might have been the first time, but was clearly trying to stoke fear in the hearts of white suburban middle class people in the United States about the kinds of changes and uh, the kinds of movements that were inflaming the United States in the late 1960s, anti-Vietnam protests, rise of black power movement, uh, and, and other heightened tensions that, that, that are very, very similar in many ways to what's going on today. And if people like Roger Stone are to be believed this was an over-calculated, planned, uh, a kind of Machiavellian strategy, knowingly designed to make people afraid in the, in the United States, make voters afraid. And we've seen research on, on fear and authoritarian tendencies in the time since then, in which it, 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 I mean, it becomes clear that whether somebody is on the left or the right or somewhere in between, if you make them afraid of a threat, they will move in an authoritarian direction, even if a little bit, the entire curve gets shifted to the right, as it were. Everybody becomes a little bit more pro-authoritarian when they, when they think that they are under threat. Karen Stenner has written on this and others since her, 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 her work on what's called the, the authoritarian dynamic from 2005 has been quite influential. Authoritarian predispositions are activated in times of heightened moral threat perceptions to yield intolerant attitudes and preferences. Um, another question is how uh, greater sources of information, Tully just mentioned this, but um, um, the internet and more, and more information by silos, we're all in silos. 
uh, because of the internet? How does this play into the new scenario? Also, the focus on identity is important, obviously, but demographics have changed since the 1960s through immigration, much more of a Latino and Asian presence. And how would this factor into to the um, uh, to the to the research you're doing, Robert? Um, so I, I guess my uh, to, to summarize a little bit here, last couple of minutes. Uh, the, my, to my my sense is that paranoid gives the impression that impression that the speaker actually believes what he or she is saying rather than rationally seeking to manipulate a gullible audience a la Roger Stone and Steve Bannon, Bannon or clever clever manipulators. And if the, if the discourse and the narrative process is intentional and rational, is it still paranoid? Joseph McCarthy may have been paranoid. Richard Nixon uh, may have been paranoid in some ways. Trump, uh, I'm not sure at all about that. And, and Steve Bannon, even less so. Um, I think it could be, could be useful to look into cues, the dog whistles, the discourse, how this works exactly, how politicians convince people with what seem like untrue stories. Uh, is it through repetition? Is that the mechanism? Uh, this work by Russell Muirhead and Nancy Rosenblum from last year about the importance of repetition in, 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 in generating a new conspiracism. I also think that uh, the work of Robert Schiller, uh, the economist on narrative economics and how stories go viral might make uh, some sense in, in the context of, of the work that you're doing here, Robert. And finally, um, perhaps it would be good if you could tell us a little bit more about where you, where do you, where do you plan to go with the paper? What, what's it gonna look like at the end? Um, what kind of study will it be, empirical or, or or theoretical or, or something in between. Okay, that's it for me. Over to you, Thomas or Robert. Okay, thanks so much, uh, um, uh, Mark. Uh, terrific. Robert, urgent need to respond? Uh, we, could, we could open it up for discussion. I, I don't mind that. Okay. okay, then let's open up. I have already Marsha. And, and she was preempted, <laughs> preempting actually something because I thought the two papers actually talk to each other but come to rather different conclusions. So it's great that Marsha is on the list number one and then we have Salma. Marsha, please. Um, Thomas, if, if you want to say what you were going to say about the two papers, I'm, I don't want to preempt uh, anything. Oh, go, for, go for it, go for it, it's fine. Um, I just um, I just wanted to um, give an opportunity for some clarification between making people afraid um, as though engendering fears of what otherwise would not be fearful as distinguished from tapping into uh, existing fears uh, from a wide range of sources, including um, and you can tell from my paper, including um, uh, fears or concerns that are ready to hand or available in the culture. Yeah, so that you can have a fear in a, a, a recent uh, a recent increase in oil prices. Okay, so that can that can engender a concern because you're dependent on uh, petrol. But you can also have fears that are culturally available in in your culture, and that will be contingent, of course. So I just wanted to raise the the um, the possible distinction between creating de novo fears and the effectiveness of tapping into a wide range of existing concerns. Um, be they um, local or be they culturally rooted. Okay, uh, I now have six people on my list. Uh, Salma is next. Yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Um, just a very quick question following up Marcia. Is that I thought like, so fear would, producing a, would produce a herding behavior. Uh, in a community. But I think we also would have to look beyond, uh, you know, the existing ways in which this herding takes place. Uh, the idea is that once this herding takes place, then somebody would benefit, you'd be able to have control over it. 
Um, so if there are multiple source, sources in which this fear could be uh, you know, engendered, produced, uh, and then could be uh, you know, used, then how do, you, um, how do you keep control for the kind of political outcome you want? Um, and is it, is it, it can also be that within a family, for example, uh, very quickly, uh, you know, I mean, different experience of different generations may not produce the same kind of impact uh, also. So uh, would that then also mean that maybe if the older generation still, uh, you know, the trigger factor is other, other things and the younger ones are looking at social media, uh, will it still produce the same kind of the herd? Will it be part of that larger one herd or will we see some kind of breakdown happen in terms of the political participation or, or not? Thanks. Next is Laura. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I had a question about the causal direction here. So you write that polarization is uh, provided fertile grounds for conspiracy theories. And I'm thinking of um, Eric Oliver's work where he argues the opposite essentially, or, or at least in part, he argues that uh, polarization is intensified because of a move to um, emotions, intuition, rather than certain forms of reason in the population. And he points to empirical work that shows that most Americans believe some kind of conspiracy theory, or a large percentage of Americans uh, believe some kind of conspiracy theory. And he, he can find one that you probably believe. And um, you know, if you think about you know re re reports about what people think about vaccines or COVID or 5G and satellite towers. I mean, all over the world, people believe certain kinds of conspiracy theories. And his argument is that, um, and, and he, he argues that they're not, these beliefs is not, are not predicted by party affiliation. So essentially he wants to turn the causal arrow in the other direction. And I wanted to ask how you see that and you know, how you would situate your work uh, in, in relation to his conspiracy theories work. Thanks, Laura. Uh, next is Tully. Ali? I don't have a question. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, I, I just saw right. your, that was a contrib contribution. Okay. Just uh, a reading suggestion. Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay, then actually I'm next. Um, and it's, a, I don't know, I use partisan bubbles and uh, Frederica, I see the check calls it polarization. I think it's, uh, so my, my, my question is, and that's an empirical question. Um, how much information do we have on how many people are actually living in these type of bubbles? You know, where your partisan beliefs line up with your cultural beliefs, with your religious beliefs, your economic beliefs, etc., where you communicate only, I mean, where, where you have this echo chamber effect as far as, as, as media reception is concerned, uh, etc. Because um, if, I mean, you make it, sh make it seem as this is now the overwhelming reality uh, in the United States. And I have to say, this is absolutely not my uh, perception. They might exist, but how widespread it is, is it? And, and this comes, there I come back to Marsha. Uh, you know, Marsha starts from the evangelical um, uh, experience and, and she shows that it's very complicated and actually differentiated and people do get exposed to different kind, uh, kinds of, uh, uh, of voices. So, um, so I, just, I just want to know uh, the, uh, about the data that we have about this, um, uh, about that phenomenon. Because if you take it to the extremes, um, then the country is kind of doomed. And your final sentence in your memo makes no sense because there is no moral grounding anymore that transcends these partisan type of, of, of communities. So it's kind of hanging in the air in, in a sense. Okay, Frederike is next. Pillarization. It's really very close to what you just asked from us. Um, I mean, it's just another word probably for, for uh, being caught in a bubble all the way down. Um, and uh, pillarization, as far as I understood, 
or understand the concept um, was usually um, related to religious affiliations and the divisions uh, within society based on religion all the way down. So as just as Thomas just explained. So I was just wondering whether this is in your perspective, the difference uh, when looking at uh, the US society today, is there a kind of polarization emerging from these paranoia um, belief systems, uh, which would actually somehow link it to religion maybe? So is paranoia the new polarization and consp conspiracy theories? And if it's just the Republican party actually, is there some mechanism that drags everyone else into this kind of, uh, societal division. So it's really close to what Thomas just asked. I was just wondering. Okay, uh, last on my list is Hans Jürgen. Well, I, I could uh, follow up uh, on what Frederike said. Uh, I think uh, uh, there are certain continuities of the paranoid style as Hofstetter uh, defined it, but there are also uh, uh, very essential and uh, uh, important new elements. And I think the missing link between Goldwater and Hofstetter on the one side and Trump, uh, Trump now uh, is uh, what I would call the destruction of the Republican Party as an independent political actor, which happened in two waves beginning in the 90s and then after 2008, 2009 with the Tea Party and others in a way that it was uh, almost destroyed uh, as an actor so that Trump could hijack it. And I think Trump cannot be explained without this uh, uh, process, despite all the continuities we may find since the 60s or 70s. Marsha, you want to come in on this? Yeah, you just posted a chat. I like it. Do you want to read it? <laughs> Are my educated liberal democratic Manhattan colleagues in a bubble or pillar? Caution about creating a them of those who are pillarized, unlike our broke minded selves. Exactly. Hmm. Well, maybe if I, if I can suggest a, a small okay. response, I'm inundated with, with very valuable comments. Uh, so, so, I mean, to begin with, thank you, right? Um, I, I do appreciate the, the energy and the vigor uh, at this time of the morning or evening. Uh, so, so thank you very much. Uh, this, this wasn't supposed to be a paper, if you will. This was, I read Memo as uh, an opportunity to probe and to kind of put some things out there and, you know, stimulate a bit of a discussion, uh, kind of like an exercise. And I think if that was my aim, then I've, I've certainly done it, which is, which is good. Uh, going back to what, what Mark was asking at the very beginning, you know, where, where was this going or where is this going? I'm looking very much at questions, questions of polarization in, in my own work. And I'm, I'm, I'm playing with this, this distinction of an issue-based polarization and an identity-based polarization. And the paranoid style, right, because it's, it's very much kind of a style, I think it taps into this notion of identity-based polarization. Right? As we've discussed in this session, the, the fear of the outsider, right? instrumentalizing that fear, cueing that fear. Uh, somebody, I, I think it was Mari talked about tapping into something, uh, absolutely tapping into something, tapping into decades, if not, if not centuries of, of a very difficult race relation, uh, an inability really to, uh, to reconcile America's kind of cosmopolitan and, and melting pot projects. Um, so all these tensions are pre-existing. And I think what, what the Republican Party has done very successfully, right, is to be able to then instrumentalize these existing fears. You, we can debate whether, you know, whether this was a process that began in the 19th century, whether it really took off in the 60s with Nixon and his, you know, his, his law and order uh, uh, mannerisms and, and, and rhetoric or if it was Reagan and the far right uh, and, the, and the evangelicals. But I think that this is, it's, it's almost beyond the point. The point is in my, in my little memo, I talk about the paranoid style uh, being here to stay because it's effective. It's, it's phenomenally effective. And, and this gets to, I think something that Thomas was, was, was fundamentally asking, well then, you know, do we have any, any sense of hope? Um, 
I think we do. I think it's very valuable uh, to, to point out that we don't all live in bubbles. We have, we have exchanges and that we intermingle. Um, and, you know, my, my friends from Manhattan also are, are friends with people from Colorado and we engage and it's not as desperate as, 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 it, as it sounds. However, it's moving in the wrong direction. And this is where this concept of, I think, sorting and alignment comes into play, right? Where partisans are now aligning with identities and we are living in spaces which are more sorted, right? This, I talked about landslide districts as evidence of that, but also sorting is taking place institutionally, right? In terms of the news that we watch, the beer that we drink, the movies that we go see, right? It's, happen it's happening culturally as well. The manners with which we, we, we speak and engage with each other are, are drifting apart as well. So one has to be aware, I think, of these trends and the direction that this is all taking. There's so many valuable comments and I, I feel that I, I would want to engage individually with all of you. Um, but I suppose that I, I just leave it with, uh, leave it with, with kind of a thought of, of, of where the country is heading. I think that the, you know, the country has potentially never been more divided, at least not, not, not in my young life. And, and I can't, maybe the sixties, people make comparisons to the late sixties, 1968 in particular. Uh, but I'm, I'm not so sure how we can possibly crawl out of it. Uh, thank you. We still have some time. So Marsha, do you want to come in here? You posted something. Microphone. Yeah. Uh, okay, just to build on this on this question of polarization or bubble, um, this um, this dovetails to with my work on populism, not evangelicalism. Just to underscore um, that the, they are not synonymous by any means, and actually, in my research, was separated by about a decade. Um, but. Um, uh, that there, that populism is not a, um, a, a, a monolithic or block phenomenon, and rather the criteria that I put on the beginning of my memo, one of them is to identify um, where you fall on a, on a continuum of strong and weak populisms. And one of the criteria is, um, how do you, do, um, do you define the other on issue just as you mentioned, Robin, on issues. Well, you believe in raising the minimum wage and I don't. Or do you identify the other on essentialist, not un unchangeable criteria like race, uh, religion, exactly. um, or the non-locality in the American case of central government, which is very Absolutely. much. And to underscore so, that, this notion of democratic bargaining, right? You can, you can bargain with an issue-based polarization. In fact, polarization can be a good thing. Right, because it, it has there's a clear delineation between the public policy platforms of the parties, right? So people know what they're voting for. It, it can be positive. You go back to Democratic theorists like Powell and, and, and Schnatzider, I mean, they, they, they discuss this. But then when does it become toxic to democracy? And I, I suppose what I'm getting at is that this, this style of paranoia has tapped into something kind of visceral, an identity. And this visceral identity is non negotiable. It doesn't exist in the realm of democratic bargaining. It exists distinct to the realm of democratic bargaining. You do not negotiate on issues of, of identity because they are, as Thomas said earlier, essentialized. And this is what concerns me, is that the, the polarization in the United States isn't so much on the issues per se anymore, but on how we align or associate with each other, right? Are you on team A or team B? And at this point, there can be then no compromise. There can be no Habermasian deliberation. There can be no rational discourse because one doesn't engage in that kind of playing field when it's a matter of domination, of winning or being destroyed. And this is exactly the tactic of Mitch McConnell. It's exactly the tactic of the Republican Party. And it's, it's wrought absolute havoc on our, on our democracy. And one party, I must add, is way more to blame than the other. And I think that also as political scientists, we, we have to do a better job of I think, calling it out as it is, if you will. Because um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that we can take much more of it. Okay, famous final words <laughs> for, for this session. Yes, it is allowed to sometimes have a partisan perspective. That's okay. That's fine with us. So, um, 
I don't see anybody uh, right now. So we are 10 minutes uh, early, which is not too bad. So nevertheless, we gonna, uh, because uh, we really have to keep to the time schedules because we have people sh coming in and out. So, um, so let's, um, let's reconvene at 12.15 Wyoming time and 8.15 p.m. Uh, Berlin time. So that gives the Berliners or the Germans the opportunity to watch the Tagesschau show in between and then come back <laughs> here. <laughs> All right. So for, for everybody else, Tagesschau show is the kind of the famous nightly news up to the point where in the 1960s, most Germans thought that the speaker for the Tagesschau show is a government employee and gives is a, is a, is a government per, uh, uh, spokesperson. Okay, so so that you get a little bit of background. All right, so we see each other in twenty five in exactly twenty five minutes then. All right, super.